Hello, this is Mr. Marek, and in this video we're going to be learning about the properties of waves. You may have an idea of what a wave is and be able to give um, examples of a wave, but you probably don't really have a very good definition of a wave. A wave is a disturbance which moves through a medium. So waves are ways to transfer energy and information um, across a medium or stuff. So an example, which we've seen in class, if you shake one end of a long spring, like so, then you create a wave, which is going to then move through the spring. And so that disturbance of shaking the spring up the end causes that disturbance to move through the wave as the bits and pieces of the spring push and pull on each other. So that moving disturbance is what we refer to as a wave. Um, a single wave like that is often referred to as a wave pulse. We'll talk in a few minutes about what happens when you continuously disturb the medium. So again, the term medium simply means stuff that you move through. In order to have a wave, you have to have a medium in order for it to move through. So some properties of a wave. We're going to start with the amplitude, which is a word we should be familiar with. Amplitude refers to the maximum displacement of any point on the medium from its equilibrium position. So if I draw a dashed line like that to represent the equilibrium position, or x naught, and I have a wave that looks like this, then this distance right here represents the amplitude. Now, if I have a wave that's shaped like this, then this distance right here represents the amplitude. This distance right here is also the amplitude. So when you're asked to figure out what is the amplitude of a wave, remember that it's from equilibrium. Different shapes of waves may give you different um, amplitude values. The amplitude of a wave is determined by the amount of work done in creating that disturbance. So the more force and the more displacement in creating that disturbance, the more, or excuse me, the higher the amplitude is going to be. And so the amplitude determines the amount of energy that is actually carried by the wave. So an example, water waves at the beach when they're small will carry low energy. Water waves, which are real tall, will carry a lot of energy. And so tsunamis are dangerous, not because they move fast, but because they're tall waves, and so they're capable of knocking over buildings and things like that. So when you're wondering what effect the amplitude has, think about waves at the beach. The taller they are, the more they push you. The velocity of a wave, um, the definition of velocity is still the same. It's simply the displacement over time. And so if I have a wave pulse like this at a specific time, and then two seconds later it moves this far, so suppose that were 12 meters, then we still figure out the velocity by doing the displacement over time. So in this example, the wave crest moves 12 meters. It takes two seconds for it to do so which gives us a velocity of 6 meters per second. Now the velocity of a wave only depends on one thing, and that's the medium through which it travels. The word medium here is very important. Only by changing the medium can you change the velocity of a wave. So for example, the springs that we use in class the velocity of the wave is dependent on the tension in the spring. The tighter the tension is, the tighter the spring is, the faster waves travel through it. Water waves at the beach, the velocity is dependent on how deep the water is. That's what actually causes them to break as they move into shallower water. For sound waves moving through air, it's the temperature of the air, which has the biggest effect on the velocity of the sound wave. And so what we have to remember is that the velocity depends only on the medium. Now, this is different than objects. For an object, the energy determines the velocity. 
for a wave, the medium determines the velocity. So one thing we kind of got to get through our heads is that these things are going to be different for waves than they have been for objects. There are two broad categories or types of waves. The first being a transverse wave. If I just asked you to draw a wave, chances are you would draw a transverse wave. In a transverse wave, the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction that the wave travels. And so the wave examples I've drawn so far are examples of transverse waves. The wave moves to the right, but the medium moves up and down. And so up and down is perpendicular to right. A longitudinal wave is where the disturbance is parallel to the direction that the wave travels. Keyword, parallel. Now a longitudinal wave is more difficult to draw because the medium is going to be moving to the right and the wave is going to be moving to the right. And so the only way that we can actually draw that is to draw what the medium itself looks like. And so an example again, using our springs, um, in order to make a longitudinal wave, you would actually squeeze the coils of the spring together, kind of like pinch them together, without moving the spring up or down. And so when you would draw that, it would look like that, where some areas of the springs are squeezed together, whereas other areas of the spring are stretched out. And so when you let go of the springs, it will cause a wave to move through the spring to the right, and the coils will shake left and right. That's kind of hard to draw and kind of hard to visualize, which is why it's important that we take advantage of opportunities where we actually see that in action. A continuous wave, which is often referred to as a periodic wave, means that the source of the disturbance, the thing that is causing the wave, is oscillating. Another word for oscillating often used for wave sources is vibrating. So that means that it's moving continuously back and forth, up and down, side to side, whatever. Now if the wave source is sinusoidal, like something moving in simple harmonic motion, then the wave is going to be sinusoidal as well. So remember our good, def our good example of sinusoidal motion um, is a simple harmonic oscillator like a mass on a spring. So if I have a mass on a spring that's continuously moving up and down, remember that that means its position is proportional to the sine of time as time passes, then it's going to create a wave that looks like that. So you can imagine if this is something bobbing up and down in water, the blue wave that I just drew would represent the shape of the water as the waves travel to the right. So in a periodic wave like this one, the position of the medium is proportional to the sine of t as well. In fact, each little point on the medium itself is going to move just like a simple harmonic oscillator would. And so if you picked a random point on the wave, like that one right there, it's going to move up and down in exactly the same manner as the mass on the spring does. It's not going to move forward. It only moves up and down, whereas the disturbance is what moves forward. So we can characterize continuous waves in terms of their period and frequency. These are terms we've seen before. In terms of waves, the period is the time needed for a wave to repeat itself, and the frequency is the number of waves created per second. These two things are actually inverses of each other. Remember that frequency is measured in hertz, which is 1 over second, named after a guy named Heimlich Hertz, who was instrumental in developing the radio. And again, the period and the frequency are inverses of each other. Remember, inverse is a fancy way of saying that frequency is 1 over t, t is equal to 1 over f. And so when one gets bigger, 
the other gets smaller. The position of a point on a wave is given by the same equation as the position of a simple harmonic oscillator, where x is equal to a cosine 2 pi over the period times t. Remember, that could also be a sine instead of a cosine, just depending on where we start. Well, I can also write that in terms of the frequency. 1 over t is equal to the frequency. So for waves, which tend to repeat much quicker than um, mechanical oscillators, the position is given by a cosine 2 pi f t. So again, those mean the same thing, just waves are often easier to characterize in terms of frequency than period. Frequencies will be big numbers, whereas periods will be small fractions or decimals. So the equation on the right may be more useful. Periodic waves can also be characterized by their wavelength. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between any repeating point on the wave. The symbol that we use for wavelength is the Greek letter lambda which I kind of think of as being a stick figure brontosaurus. You might also kind of think about it as an upside down Y. Um, so practice drawing some lambdas um, and be able to say the term lambda um, because we're going to be using that symbol often. Wavelength is kind of important to waves. And so if I plot out a mechanical wave, a transverse wave, like this one, and kind of drew it carefully so that the um, wavelength isn't changing, then the wavelength would be the distance between any two repeating points, such as these two. The peaks or crest of a wave are repeating points on it, so from one crest to another would be one wavelength. Same thing for the points on the bottom, which are sometimes referred to as troughs. It could also be from the equilibrium position to the equilibrium position. Now be cautious with this one. The distance I've drawn here is an example of a wavelength, but this distance right here is not a wavelength. That distance right there would actually be one half of a wavelength. So when you say from one point on the wave to the next repeating point, it has to not only be at the same position, but also the graph needs to be moving in the same direction. And so if it's sloping downward, then it needs to be measured to another point at equilibrium that is sloping downward as well. So just be cautious with that. Now the wavelength of a wave depends on two things. The first is the velocity of the wave. The faster the waves travel from their source, then the further apart they're going to be. A good analogy is cars on a highway. The further apart, or excuse me, the faster the cars on the highway go, the more spread out they are. The second factor is the frequency. The more waves that are created per second, the closer the waves are going to be. So using the cars on a highway analogy, the less, or excuse me, the more cars that go by a point in any given time, the closer together they're going to have to be. And so putting these two ideas together, we can write an equation for finding the wavelength of a wave. Simply divide the velocity by the frequency. Remember, the velocity is controlled by the medium and nothing else. The frequency is controlled by the source, how many times it oscillates per second. And so the wavelength would be dependent on both of those things, the medium and the source. So let's look at a simple example. Let's suppose that we have a string that we create waves on using a 30 hertz source. And then let's suppose we take a meter stick and we measure that these waves are 0.5 meters apart. Physically doing that is difficult without using tricks like um, you know, strobe lights and photography and things like that. But later on in this unit, we'll look at different techniques we can use to actually measure the wavelength on a string like that. So I'm going to ask you two questions. First of all, what is the velocity? 
Well, I know that the wavelength is equal to the velocity over the frequency. And so rearranging that equation, I get something like velocity equals frequency times wavelength. And so that's pretty simple, just substituting in the numbers. Remember that a hertz is equal to 1 over a second. So when you multiply a hertz by a meter, you get meters per second. And 30 times 0.5 is 15. So the velocity of these waves is 15 meters per second. Now the second question we're going to have to put a little bit more thought into. Suppose that I double the frequency of the source. We want to figure out what happens to all three of these variables that are properties of the wave. So doubling the source, source's frequency means that our frequency would now be 60 hertz. That part is relatively easy. The next thing that we have to consider, because there's two things that we have to fill in the blanks here, is that the medium hasn't been changed any. That means that my velocity hasn't changed any. Remember, velocity depends on the medium, not the source. So now that I have two pieces of information figured out, now I can use my equation to figure out what the new wavelength is. So dividing 15 meters per second by 60 1 over second, or 60 hertz, those seconds will cancel out, leaving me with a wavelength of 0.25 meters. So if you'll notice, when I doubled the frequency, I halved the wavelength. And the opposite is true. If I were to halve the frequency, then the wavelength would double. Again, if I don't change the medium, then I don't change the velocity of the wave. Okay, so I know this has been um, kind of lengthy. If you want to read more, um, learn more, or just kind of see it in a different context with better pictures than what I can draw, check out section 11.7 in your um, electronic textbook. It kind of goes through the same material again but it does a better job of drawing diagrams and pictures over time um, that I, better than I can draw. Uh, the only downside is it doesn't talk to you like I do. Um, of course, we'll do lots of practice and stuff in class, so be sure to bring your notes with you. And if anything I said today doesn't make sense, please be sure to ask for clarification in class. That is all. Thank you and goodbye.